Live from the Export Beer Garden Studios, you're listening to the BYC. In today's podcast, we'll be casting an eye over the recent series between the Black Caps and UAE. And if we're being brutally honest, it was about as sexy as Hoity J and his trackies with a steaming Sunday hangover. We'll also preview the upcoming T20 series against the buoyant English, which promises to be a much more enticing affair, and catch up with all the chatter regarding the fast-approaching cricket. At World Club and fellas, bit of a break uh, last week, but we're back again. And uh, just right off the bat, Dylan Cleaver, um, the UAE series uh, losing a match there completely and utterly unacceptable to me. Yeah, I mean, let that sink in for a minute. And, and comprehensively, too, I might add. Oh, it wasn't a close run thing, it was pull your pants down and bend over spanking. 16th over. Yeah. Three wickets down. Oh. It was a national disgrace. And actually, Dave, Dave Lyle writes in on that similar subject, what would the equivalent loss be for the All Blacks? Yeah. That's a really I good can tell question. You. I can tell you the answer to that, Dylan. Yeah. I've gone to the rankings. New Zealand is ranked in cricket. New Zealand is ranked third and the UAE are 16th. So this is like the All Blacks losing to Tonga, Portugal or Uruguay. And it's like the Silver Ferns, who are ranked number two in netball, uh, losing to Sri Lanka or Zambia or Samoa. Right, yeah. Well, you know, just on that, I mean, I could handle the All Blacks losing to Tonga. The other guys, yeah. not so much. But, yeah, I mean, can you imagine the All Blacks being beaten by Portugal, Paul Ford? I mean, could you <laughs> imagine? And don't Do get you know me what? started I'd on Steve it. Hansen. I'd love it. I'd love it. But, uh, no, it's... it's uh, yeah, it's embarrassing. God, I mean, this was a series I was trying to ignore, but when we lose, it feels like you you can't ignore it. And so then was there joy when we won the series? No, it was almost like, oh, thank God, that's over and done with. And I, I must say, though, I'm kind of, I am slightly conflicted because I do like the fact that New Zealand can be bothered going and playing the, the smaller nations. You know, we played, the, we played the Netherlands, we played Ireland, we played Scotland, and now we play the UAE. But this, this series in particular feels like it's been crowbarred in and I don't know whether it was a B team or a C team but it very much had a sort of a development vibe in the in the selections of the squad and then the the, the selections of the match day 11 as well yeah um look I, I like you Paul I'm all for you know playing the lesser nations if you want to put it like that I think that's a great thing but not if we lose yeah I'm you know for, what I'm saying I'm you know all what for I'm beating saying? the lesser nations <laughs> yeah, yeah giving them a hiding but uh Dylan Cleaver looking at you know, this series, what do we get out of it? Absolutely nothing. It's weird. It was weird content creation for somebody's benefit. I just can't work out who. UAE players, obviously. Yes. I mean, it's tempting to say it's meaningless cricket, but it's not meaningless for those 11 fine men of the United Arab Emirates who pulled off that stunning victory. But it was played in front of, I think I tried to count, I think I got to 37 oh. people in a stadium. And when you think that the ICC is based there, so they would have probably been ICC employees or stadium employees, it was played to no one. There was at, there was no atmosphere. The cricket was poor. And to Paul's point about it being a development kind of team, it just felt really weird watching Tim Southey play. Yes. Because it's like, hey, he's a good player. He should <laughs> be there. He's doing what he's meant to be doing. Uh, who are all these other roosters? And yeah. Well, I mean, he, and he did have that outstanding five for he did have Pfeiffer. Um, yeah. and, you know, and in terms of looking what we got out of it, Paul Ford, uh, Chapman, I suppose, player of the series. Um, yeah, you he know, got you know, 100, he, he 129 made the best of off 96 balls or something. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. Jake. Yeah, no, I was saying, well, you know, he, he made hay while the sun wasn't, well, I suppose it was shining. But, yeah, it was, it, you know, and I, I've got to put this question to you, Paul Ford. When I look at a series like that, does it more? Does it do more damage than good to the game? Yeah, well, that's the thing. It was on in the dead of the night, so no one in New Zealand watched it. You know, probably fewer people watched it on TV than watched it in the stadium, and there were only twelve in the stadium, which is, yeah, it does make you wonder what the hell was the point of that of that series. Uh, you know, um, yep, yeah, maybe Mark Chapman got something good out of it. Tim Zowie looked, you know, best in class. Uh, Will Young batted had one bat, got fifty. But really, it felt like it was more about the development of, of UAE and giving them a, a a taste of international cricket. And uh, 
very strange to see the names Junaid Sadiq and Muhammad Jawadullah atop the bowling uh, statistics from mm. a series. You know, I guess if you're clutching at straws, you might say that it was nice to see Adithia um, Ashok get his first wicket in international cricket and yes. Dean, Fox, Dean Foxcroft to, to don the black cap. But yeah, it, it was, it felt, I know we talk about these sort of bilateral series sort of, um, and when you're playing T20s ahead of a one day World Cup in the middle of the UAE, it just felt kind of unnecessary, to be honest, and just yeah. cramming the schedule. Well, you actually mentioned Ashok there. I, you know, I uh, really like the look of him, Dylan Cleaver. Looking yep. forward, uh, he gives it a good tweak. He puts it up in the, into the air as well. Um, Benny Lister making a little bit more getting. I know you still not. You're not a fan, but you know he's, he's getting. A a, he's getting a few wickets, and he's you know I think he's beginning to gain some confidence and experience at that level. But Ashok, in particular, for me, I think is very much a player for the future. Oh yeah, he's a he's a real talent. He's been identified as a talent since he's about 15, 16 years old at. Um, I think it's Mount Albert Grammar that he went to. He's he's for real. I think the idea will be for him to transition and, and take the East Sodi role. Yes. And, and look, potentially he's got even more talent as a pure leg spin bowler than Ish. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I worry with a player like that, actually, um, Paul, you know, in terms of his qualities. For me, I, I, I want to see him playing test match cricket, and I, and I hope that... You know, he doesn't get put into the T20 format internationally and get the, you know, the shit smashed out of him and lose a bit of confidence. Because I think, for me, he's a long-term, you know, the test match kind of player looking to the future. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it'd be interesting looking at the pathway ahead for him because, you know, I totally agree with the intent of what you're saying, Jace, but, you know, that risks going down the Ajaz Patel pathway if he wants to become sort of a red ball specialist. So it's a it's a tricky balance to spinner in New Zealand. You know, the success and the riches and the game playing is is being done by the likes of Mitchell Santner and, um, and, and Ish Sodi, who you mentioned, Michael Bracewell, of course, another one. And, um, yeah, those real sort of pure spinners. It's a bloody hard road to hoe, for sure. Yeah. Um, Timothy C. asked Dylan Cleaver, will this be the last game for the Black Caps for some of these players? Yeah, I've made a little note there. I've, I've seen that question and I've scratched a couple of names underneath. Uh, look, I hope not, is my initial thing. Yes. Like it would be well, you stupid. wouldn't want it to be your, yeah. your sign-off, would you? You wouldn't want a, a three-match T20 series in front of no one in Dubai <laughs> to be your sign-off, no. But look, I, I have fears for, for D. Cleaver. Yes. He hasn't quite done it, uh, and I'm quite surprised by that because I think he's a really good player. But his sample size, along with Chad Bowes, is the other one I've yeah. got down here. Their sample size is not mm. insignificant now, and both of them have really only had one decent knock. I think if you take that airstrip at Rawapindi out of the picture, Chad Bowes hasn't done anything really. Uh, and the other one I uh, had scratched down, which is why I grimaced when you mentioned the name, is um, I'm still not convinced on... Benny ben, Lister. Ben Lister's ability to go up from that first-class domestic level to this level, which is strange because when I watch him in first class, when I watch him at domestic level, I think he's got the goods. Mm. And then just for some reason or another, it hasn't seemed to transfer up as easily as some other bowlers, which I am kind of surprised about. I hope it's not his last game because I do think there is real talent there, but he hasn't showed it for New yeah, Zealand. Yet. And I think I think that's a really fair point, actually, because you know I based my opinion on Benny Lister in the first class level, and I thought, geez, this guy's good. He's you know he's a big strapping lad. He moves the ball around. He's a left armer. He's got some real talent. Um, Paul Ford, your thoughts? Yeah, I scratched down. Yeah, Chad Bowes, thirty off. 31 in the UAE, three bats. You know, they've given him three cracks and uh, hasn't come off in any of them. And, yeah, Dylan Cle uh, Dylan Cleaver, D Cleaver, <laughs> not the real D Cleaver, oh. uh, four off eight in his two bats. The other the other two things that I – well, three things, actually. Cole Jamison looked pretty rusty. Good yep. to, good, good blowout for him. Thanks you know, for saying that because I was going to say how we how did we feel about Jamison's return. Yeah, means to an end. I guess, um, you know, big big picture. Good good for him to have a blowout. He he looked he dropped an absolute goober catch in that game that we lost, where the guy went from five to fifty five off twenty nine balls and basically won the game for them. So yeah, that was that was not ideal. But also there was some weird business with Ratchet and Ravindra. He only bowled three overs 
in the three matches. And one of the games, I think he batted at number nine. He it batted like, as a slogger in the first game. Really weird. Mm. So something's there's something. I know they're probably just doing experimental things, and you know who cares? And then we lose. I mean, suddenly we have to care. Uh, and also, I think the experiment of Mitchell Santner up the order of putting a red line through that. Okay. We're not trying that anymore. Good on you, mate. Hey, well, hopefully, uh, looking ahead to the future, fellas, with the upcoming series, T20 series against English, it'll be a little more enthralling. Uh, the England T20 squad, Butler, Ahmed, Ali, Atkinson, Bearstow, Brooke, Curran, Duckett, Jax, Livingston, Milan, Rashid, Tung, Kass and Wood. Pretty strong by all accounts there looking at that lineup, um, Dylan Cleaver. Yeah, I th- think maybe one of them's been ruled out with injury. Nah, yeah. Kass has come in. Kass has come, come in. Kass has come in. Okay. Yep. So there's a few cricketers there that have... have Barely seen play, Cass being one of them, Luke Wood the other, Gus Atkinson. Uh, wouldn't know him if I met him in the street. Uh, I'll tell you about Gus Atkinson. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to love him. Okay. He is rapid. He bowls, he's bowled a couple of, deliver, a couple of deliveries up around 95 miles an hour. Ooh. Ooh. So that's 153 clicks. That's that's right up there with Archer and Wood. He's, uh, he's had a... Um, I think three stress fractures over the last few years. So he's one of these kind of give it death and break yourself type guys. He is going to be, he is going to be an interesting one to watch. So yeah, Gus Atkinson, I hadn't heard of him, of him either, but uh, the name caught my eye. So uh, yeah, he, he's definitely one to, to keep an eye on for the, in the series and be afraid of, I think. And yeah. Harry, Harry Brooks in there. And that's interesting because he's missed the world cup squad, I believe. Yes, so, that's right. And he's, he, yeah. he is going to be on the rampage. He scored 105 not out of 42 balls against uh, Matt Henry and Lockie Ferguson's, Welsh fire this week just after not making that England squad so yeah look out for him and Jason I imagine you'll be keeping an eye on Josh Tung I think you were quite impressed with him in the Ashes yeah I was I, th- I thought he had some real quality as a bowler um, and I think he's got a big future as well you know I mean looking at that lineup then because I didn't know about Gus Atkinson either waiting waiting some serious pace there boys yeah, some it's, serious pace. Is that is that a? Do you think that's a deliberate tactic of the English that they're going to go for outright pace in the T twenties? Well, they they find in T twenty that outright pace and leg spin are the two keys, aren't they, to taking wickets? He, his story reminds me of maybe a little bit of a guy called Timel Mills. I don't know if you remember him, but he, I think he might have even come out and played a season. For Auckland. Big Bash? Oh, yep, yep. And Big Bash too, I think. Eh? Yeah, seriously quick, but um, can't bowl. He, he stated very early on in his career, if I bowl any more than four overs at a time, I break my back. So I'm just going to be a T20 player and <laughs> probably, um, you know, it's, yeah. good, it's good time to be a T20 player, isn't it? He, he gave me Andre Adams vibes a little bit, actually. And you mentioned Lexman there, and of course, it'd be great to see um, Rayan Ahmed, who didn't come out with the English Test team, He's the 18, maybe he's 19 now, but England, England's youngest test player last year against Pakistan when he was only 18, the the, the legs, leggy from Nottinghamshire. So he'll be he'll be a, he'll be a great great player to watch too. Uh, the New Zealand T20 squad: uh, Southie captain Alan Chapman, Conway, Ferguson, Henry, Jamison, Milne, Mitchell, Nisham, Phillips, Ravindra, Santner, Seifert, and Sodi. Bit of pace there too, Dylan. Yeah, Ferguson and Milne. I'm I'm not convinced that Ferguson's been in great fil- form for probably going on a year now. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see if he can turn that around. Um, Milne, on the other hand, has been bowling well. Yeah, it's it's a good team, but it's just not quite the same. And you don't see Kane Williamson there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, to- I totally agree. It, it, you kind of need Kane in there to make you go, yeah, okay. Yeah, sweet. I'm happy with that side. Everyone else can just fit around him. But looking at the batting once again, yeah, I mean, what's your view on it, Paul? What's your view on that squad? Uh, Mitchell and Conway are doing a lot of heavy lifting in that batting order, I think. Yeah. Um, And, yeah, I I think – yeah, without without Williamson there, uh, Bracewell feels like a bit of a, a a missing guy there. I know he's injured, but I'm just saying he sort of adds adds a, a bit of batting depth. Um, and you know, it, it does feel like it's time for Finn Allen. It's uh, this is a series I think he's got to really step up and 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 be a, a bit more of a, a 
a bit more of a banker in that top slot. Yeah, t- I totally agree with that. Now let's have a look at the uh, New Zealand A squad named to tour Australia. And uh, Paul Ford will be stoked about the first name I'm about to uh, read out here. Muhammad Abbas from Wellington. Hey, eh? Good oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Ashok, as previously mentioned, Tom Bruce, Leo Carter from Canterbury, Josh Clarks in Central Districts, Henry Cooper, Northern Districts, Jacob Duffy, Otago, Cam Fletcher, Auckland, Dean Foxcroft, Otago, Mitch Hay, Canterbury, Nick Kelly, Wellington, Scott Kugeline, Northern Districts, Will O'Rourke, Canterbury, Ajaz Patel, Central Districts, Michael Ray, Canterbury, Brett Randall, uh, Central Districts, Tom Seifert, uh, Northern Districts, Sean Solia, Auckland. Now, it's interesting, you know, it was... A little while back, Dylan Cleaver, we'd been talking about the fact that, you know, we're looking good and the depth's feeling good. And then we sort of, I guess, all came to the same conclusion. Is our depth actually looking that good? Because I don't get overly aroused by those names. No. But I am keen to, you know, to to have a look at old Muhammad Abbas there. Yeah, uh, it's a curious team for me, and I think they've got the age profile slightly wrong in this. Yes. And I'll tell you why. I reckon once you turn 26 in cricket, you know whether you're going to be good or bad. Occasionally you might get an Andrew Jones who's a really late bloomer who comes into his best years in his 30s. But generally speaking, you get to 26, 27, you know whether you're going to be a good player or not. In this New Zealand A team, which is meant to be the next best, they've got 13 players of this 18-person squad are 26 or over, mm. only five young ones, only five under 26. And that, to me, feels like they've got the balance wrong. And then you look at the batting and you're going, they're picking guys that are, are not that young and, quite frankly, aren't that good. And I, I should qualify that. Anyone that plays first-class cricket is good. But to make that jump up to test level, you really should be averaging 40-plus minimum, right, in first-class cricket. Well, you think at a bare minimum. I, yeah. I agree. Late 30s at the most. So you've got guys here that they're picking for the New Zealand A team, the second best team in New Zealand. Henry Cooper's 30 years old. He's got a first-class average, average of 35. Maybe get away with it because it's opener and op- opening can be tough in New Zealand. We'll give him a pass mark there. Leo Carter, where's he come from? 28 years old, averaging 33. Tom Bruce, I totally get. He's 32. Well, I was, that's what I was going to say. I, I, of all those players, I look at Tom Bruce and go, yeah, I can see him playing for New Zealand. Nick Kelly, 30 years old, averages 34 in first-class cricket. We've seen these guys for years. We know their level. And I, I don't know, it just – I feel like they've really missed an opportunity here. Perhaps there is no really good young batters in the country. Perhaps Muhammad Ab- Abbas and uh, – uh, Sean Soley is another one, 30 years old. He averages mm. less than 30 in first-class cricket. I know he's got bowling to his, uh, string to his bow as well. But Mitch Hay and Mua Bass and Dean Fotscroft are the only guys there that it feels like there's still a lot of growth left in their game. And, yeah, that, that batting depth really worries me. Paul Ford? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting observation, Dylan. I, I do wonder whether the fact that they're going to Australia and they're playing a – a, a really tough and reasonably grizzled Australian team as well, whether that's been a, a factor. Of course, they wouldn't have known who Australia was going to pick when they named their team. So, you know, maybe I'm drawing a bit of a long bow there. But but I think everyone would know that going to Australia to play um, their second tier is going to be um, bloody hard going. So I wonder whether they've just picked guys that have got a, a few more scars on their backs. Um but uh, yeah, look, I, I think it's a I think it's a fair point, and um, you know, thank God they have picked at least a, a few young guys. You know, uh, Ashok's in there again, um, Foxcroft, who's obviously sort of the next cab off the rank, and kind of the, I guess, a bit of a bit of a hope at least um, to, to to step up into that New Zealand team over the next twelve to twenty four months or, or, or thereabouts. Um, yeah, and I mean, and and you mentioned Bruce, of course, he's the captain, so you know, you don't mind having a couple of. Uh, wise old heads in the in the leadership roles. But, um, yeah, it, it's interesting when you – and I know you were kind of joking, Jace, but, you know, it's great to see Mua M- Bass in there. But, um, yeah, it feels like he is the only young batsman in there that's that's been given a shot. Mitch Hay, maybe, the, the canter. Yeah, I haven't – how old is he? I haven't got him in my head. He's 23 and he averages 40, okay. 42, uh, 43. Yeah, good call. But he's, I mean, 
very small sample size, I think. He's he's really only broken through in the last couple of years. But that's the kind of guy that I think you got important, to chat. Yeah, important well, to back. Well, I think. Paul, you're making a good point in terms of, you know, they want some experience there. It's going to be a pretty tough tour. My thinking on those lines is, well, exactly. So give these young fellas an opportunity, chuck them in the fire and see how they go. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what is there to lose? Oh, this this game, and they're playing first-class cricket, So and they're playing one days, but let's just look at the first-class, the Red Bull side of it. Your New Zealand A team needs to be the guys that you think will be the next ones to play test, test cricket. cricket. Yeah. And too many of these guys, I just, I do not think fit that profile. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting too when you look at the the, the Australian A team. I just had a quick squiz at it um, just, just before coming on here. And um, first of all, coached by Adam Voges, of course, what the second greatest Test average of yep. uh, of all time. But uh, you know that's trivia trivia corner. Um, and uh, I think Tim Payne is in an assistant coach role, his uh, debut in the coaching ranks for Australia. But yeah, you've got. Guys in that Australian team, Todd Murphy is in there. Matt Renshaw, of course, they're in the incumbent test squad. Um, you've got Cameron Bancroft, Wes Agar. You've got Ben McDermott, Josh Philippe, Ashton Turner, Matt Short, who was the K- KFC uh, Big Bash Player of the Year. You know, th- there's a hell of a lot of experience in there as well. You know, uh, just another one that caught my eye, just as I was casting my eye down there, is uh, Mitchell Swepson's in there and, of course, Manus. Um, Labashane's in there as well. So, you know, they are... They are when you talk about the next tier of cricketers for Australia, that is very much what they've gone for in their squad. Yeah. Well, this is interesting too, just going through this Black Caps coaching team. Mm. And that's like a rotation going on there as well. England T20s, uh, August 30 to 5th of September, the coaching uh, side there, Gary Stead, Ronke, Jurgensen and Bell. The England one day is Stead, Jurgensen, Bell, James Foster slash Stephen Fleming. Bangladesh one day is Ronke, Jurgensen, Bell. Cricket World Cup, Stead, Ronke, Jurgensen, Foster. Bangladesh tests, Ronke, Saklan, Mustak, and uh, the bowling coach to be called. So Stead's getting a bit of time off there. The yeah. Bangladesh tests and the Bangladesh ODIs. Do you <laughs> um, think, yeah, is that is that all it is? Is just resting <laughs> them up a bit? Yeah, I think so. I think they've uh, they made... Note of when Hessen was coach, I think there was some year where he spent an extraordinary amount of time away from home and it was um, decided that wasn't optimal. But the interesting thing for me is James Foster is uh, going to the World Cup. And Stephen Fleming. Yeah, it's great to see Fleming in there. I mean, I I, I just don't think that New Zealand's going to have the cash to get him um, to be a sort of a white ball coach on any sort of permanent basis. He's obviously over in England at the moment. I think he's coaching the is it the Southern Brave or one of the 100 teams anyway. So um, I guess living and breathing those English conditions and obviously a, one of the New Zealand's great cricketing minds. So it's it's awesome that he's um, made himself available because I would imagine that um, he's doing it for love, not, not, for, uh, n- not for too much money. And Ian Bell, what a player he was. He yes. Was beautiful batter to watch. Oh, so, so I thought you were taking the piss. <laughs> you didn't like watching him, Matt? Oh, yeah, I enjoyed it, yeah. Was was Ian the one with the weird shuffle yep. across? Won the Ashes five times, I think. So, you know, pretty he can play. He's in some decent teams. You're sure. thinking he's not the world's best-looking fella, aren't you? Yeah, That's well, you yeah, mate. Are you picking your coaches on aesthetics, Jace? How shallow? Well, I want my coaches to be good-looking men and or women. Uh, you know what I mean? Actually, there's a real absence of good-looking players in New Zealand at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed. And is that an issue? Is that something we need to be looking at? Fast-tracking some Hot of the better-looking better players <laughs> through the system a bit quicker. Good question, mate. Good question. I mean, we're far cry from the days of your Flemings, your Kenses. Yeah. Well, we got uh, Matt Henry Nash. still. Nash. Is I mean, I mean, Southie's a good-looking fella. Well, what happens when Southie and Matt Henry and Will Young retire? Yeah, that's true. We'll look into that maybe in the next podcast. Now, with the World Cup coming up, um, Paul Ford Stokes unretires. Yeah, it's an interesting one. And, uh, of course, you know, we mentioned it earlier, Harry Brook was deemed to be the one that missed out. And I imagine he's um, polite on the outside, but absolutely seething on the inside. And God, I'm, God forbid that I care too much about what Tim Payne thinks. But uh, he did make the point. It does feel a little bit like a bit of me, 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 that I'll just pick and choose where I want to play and when I want to play, and maybe that's just the big tournaments. That said, 
if Ben Stokes was available in any team in the world, I'd pick him. So, you know, I kind of get it, but it's an interesting precedent. Haven't we got the same situation with lovely Trenty to an extent? Absol- absolutely. But I do, I guess the point I'm making is I think it, it sets an interesting precedent for players, you know, over the next few years, which which means that when they get sort of good enough, they can just come and go as they please. And I, and I think that that's going to get us into some murky territory. From our point of view in New Zealand, I think it's completely realistic because we're only going to be paying them a few hundred grand, whereas but, they can earn bazillions overseas. Um, you know, Stokes, I think, would get paid, paid pretty nicely um, to, to make himself available for England. Yeah, but Harry Brook? Mm. I mean, how good is he, man? What? Yeah. And he's only played... I. I think three one day is Harry Brook. So it's it's amazing how his brand and his reputation built around T20s and frankly, mainly from our and out from you know um test cricket, you know, blazing in test cricket, playing T twenty cricket in the long form game. Um yeah, he's very much a um not well, he he is not an incumbent and not uh, you know an immediate pick in that one day team. So it's kind of not that weird. I was quite surprised that he'd only played three one days. Yeah. Bumra uh, returns, quality player. Good player. Really good player. What's the, been the issue with him, injury? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a, just a fascinating player to watch. That Love him. I love him. He's a great bowler. Strange run up. The arm shooting out to the side. This podcast, you can't see what I just did then, but I just shot my arm out to the side. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's good. Stokes is unretiring. Bumra's back. Kane's not far away, we hope. Yeah. Well, let's... Just on that, uh, I was just reading about him today, and um, I, I don't know what your vibe is, fellas. Feels to me like he's going to be there for the World Cup. Um, you know, uh, he's making good progress, not playing yet, but what are your thoughts there, Paul? Yeah, look, I oh, it, it's def- I feel like there's kind of this um, very deliberate um, – there's been some very deliberate content to make us start to get our hopes up. And I think that would be incredibly stupid if they now don't pick him and that he's actually not as good as what he has come across in the social media posts and all that kind of stuff. I think if he was really uh, no chance whatsoever, I think we'd be seeing him keeping below the parapet. So, yeah, I'm I'm very optimistic. Um, albeit I don't think he'll play those first few games. Um, I think he's going to be a bit of a, a, a sort of Johnny-come-lately into, into playing and getting that knee right. Yeah, great stuff. Knee? Was it his knee? Is that right? Yes, yeah. cruciate knee. ligament, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Waiting! Waiting! But right now it's time for the ever popular news or ooze. Yes, and of course the uh, Oi Hoi Trophy is on the mantelpiece at Dylan Cleaver's house. Uh, three pieces of news, there'll be something wrong with one of these three. Here we go. Uh, as the cricket world approaches, the ICC has introduced its mascot duo. For the upcoming prestigious event, brace yourselves for this one, fellas. It sounds horrific. Originating from a distant cricket utopia called the Cryptiverse, oh, the God. male and female mascots represent distinct traits that stand as symbols of gender equality and diversity. With a turbo-powered arm propelling fireballs at lightning speed, the female character's pinpoint accuracy leaves even the boldest batters in awe. The male character exudes an unmistakable blend of sub-zero coolness and high-voltage batting prowess. I didn't write this. This is just in the release. <laughs> the f- and uh, they haven't got names, which is why I'm just referring to them in that sort of uh, in those oblique terms. And here is one of the worst quotes ever known to cricket and the whole of human history from a punishing bloke in the ICC. He said, The perpetual characters signify cricket's universal appeal beyond cultures and boundaries. The mascots stand as beacons of unity, and passion, they represent both genders and epitomise the vital role of gender equality in a dynamic world. Oh, that God. just made me throw up in Save my mouth. Me. I mean, can God. you imagine the wank fest that went on creating that nonsense? <laughs> Seriously, people it's sitting around a table ball going, oh, OK, and it was, that was horrendous. <laughs> Dylan, you're a writer, for God's sake. You must have been deeply offended by that. The whole thing just was cringe and still no room for non-binary genders in there, I noticed. Back, oh, back to the drawing board, ICC. Good Seriously. Lord. Seriously. All right. All right. Number two, uh, Protea Test Bowler Kagiso Rabada has emphasised that as Test players, the South Africans do not have the power to influence the South African uh, te- uh, the South African team's T20 obligations versus the Black Caps Test and the, the clash that will see them miss 
the two test matches next year. Well, a lot of their main players. 20% of the test matches that South Africa are scheduled to play in 2024 will be missed, including the two test match series against New Zealand by players such as Rabada, Ngidi, Janssen, Nortia, Maharaj, Harmer, Bavuma, Markram, Rickleton, Klaassen and Rassi van der Dussen. Despite the fact that the players are the most affected, almost no public platform has been given to, to even to the captain of the test team, Timba Bavuma. They, they've got nothing to say. Um, yeah, it's an absolute debacle, chaps, and it's uh, I'm, I'm gutted about it, actually. It's a shambles. And number three, Pakistan's spectacular, spectacle-wearing batsman, Imil Haq, Imil, Imam Al-Haq, has opened up about the chance that have prevented his parents from watching him play. Imam's ODI debut was marred by accusations of nepotism because his uncle, Pakistan legend Mizbah Al-Haq, led the selection panel. He quickly silenced his critics by scoring exactly 100 on his maiden appearance against Sri Lanka. Here's what he said. When I used to go out to dinner with my family, people would come up and call me Parchi, which means <laughs> it's sort of a um, it's a word which means, which hints at nepotism. And they would call him a Parchi in front of his parents. I'd be sitting at Nando's with my family and young students would be saying, look, the Parchi is there, the Parchi is there. And I would feel the worst my parents don't even come to watch me play. They've never seen me play at a venue once because they just hear people st- uh, chanting Parchi, Parchi when I'm fielding on the boundary. Oh. Shit house. Wow. Yeah, it is. I'm first. Well, just and I'm jump conf- in there, Dylan, why don't really you? Confident. I mean, God, I'm so confident. Out. Uh, it's, it's definitely story three. And there's two things that caught my ear. Nando's. Yes, but I'm still going with the fact that it's actually Inzamam that's his uncle, not Mizbah. All right, then. Well, I mean, I've got no choice. I'm going to have to go Nando's. You can go another story. Nando's. No. No. You both got the right story. It was actually Nando's, and Dylan, that is correct. It was Inzamam, the Motualu, the big fat potato, who is uh, Imam's uncle. I'm an unstoppable force in this at the moment. Oh, I think we'll find a way to stop you. Don't yeah, you don't you worry that. about that. <laughs> Paul and I are going to have a chat after the uh, podcast. <laughs> hey, to stay um, on the call at the end, Jason. I've just got a couple yeah, of tips. Yeah, yeah, good stuff, mate. Uh, what's happening in Cricket Violence Corner? Paul Ford's Cricket Violence Corner. We're in uh, Tirupati uh, this week, boys. A junior student at the Sri Venkateswara Medical College attacked his seniors with a surgical blade and a cricket stump at the college hostel premises during the early hours of Tuesday morning. The assailant allegedly assaulted the senior members of the hostel between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. He used a surgical blade to slash the the throat of one student, then attacked the head of another with a cricket stump. Police said the attack was due to a disagreement over a trivial issue. They've sent blood samples of the accused to a lab to establish whether the accused had been under the influence of alcohol at the time of the attack. It sounds like he was massively steamed, to be honest. Yeah. I I notice a theme with Cricket Violence Corner. It often comes from the subcontinent, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think they're just very much more uh, diligent at reporting cricket-related news. (laughs) (laughs) Like, if it's got cricket in it, they're into it. And, like, I imagine people click on it, you know? It's a bit like us with rugby. We'll click on anything. Totally. Hey, now to your correspondence. Topper Correspondence of the Week, brought to you by Lena NZ's Lasagna Topper. G'day, fellas. Love the BY... Oh, this is from Gavin B, by the way. G'day, fellas. Love the BYC. Thanks for keeping me sane and happy over the years, going through life with your dulcet tones in my ears. A quick one for you, now that Tim Southey is first equal with Shakib Al-Hassan in terms of the most wickets in T20 cricket by any bowler, how many of those would he give up for more test wickets if he could, Dylan Cleaver? Well, it's a really interesting question, and that infers that, obviously, they wouldn't consider T20Is at the same level as they would test or ODIs. But, Fair enough. But I reckon... Dad, right. I reckon that Tim Southey would be pretty happy with the 370 test wickets. He's past Daniel Luca Vittori. He's on his way 60... One more wickets to catch Sir Richard of Canterbury. That's probably 15 more tests he gets there. So I reckon he's pretty happy with this test. Like he's actually taken 720 international wickets, Jim Southey, which is 
uh, he sailed past Daniel Vittori, who was previous top with 696. So I reckon Tim's pretty happy with his 140. He's a still wart. I don't reckon he'd give too many away because this is a world record. It might, it might seem like a trivial world record now, but in 20 years' time, we're going to look at T20i lists, or the kids of today are going to look at T20i lists and treat them with this probably more reverence than we look at ODI yeah. lists now. Fair point. Paul? Yes, although we'll probably play 50,000 T20s per annum, and so 140 wickets will be about 912th on the list. I, I but, get your but point. But he though, has been a, a world record holder. It's a, it's a, it's, and, it, and it is a good one. I'm trying, I was trying to work out why... Why he's ranked second. Maybe his average is inferior to Shaki Bahasan. I'll answer the question, though, and it references the number that you did as well. I think he'd give back 62 of those wickets to turn them into, or trade them in, sort of airpoint style, and get some uh, get himself up to 432 test wickets, and then he can put his feet up as the most wickets in test cricket by any New Zealand bowler. Great stuff, mate. Great stuff. Just uh, regarding the correspondence, what needs to happen if you want to get in touch with us, Paul Ford? Flick us an email to byc at beigebrigade.co.nz or slide into the DMs on Facebook or Instagram for the Beige Brigade or the Alternative Commentary Collective and it'll find its way to us. Great and, stuff, uh, We mate. will talk about it very soon. Good on you, mate. Uh, Dylan Cleaver, what's going on in the bounce? The bounce is gearing up for two back-to-back World Cups. Yes. Rugby cricket World Busy Cup. time for you, mate. It'll be a very busy time. be burning the midnight oil. There will be a special offer for those... Uh, free subscribers that are on the free plan, if they want to boost themselves up to the pay plan for the World Cup, so get on dylancleaver.substack.com or just Google Dylan Cleaver in the bounce. Love to have you along for the ride. Good on you, mate. Hey, well, there you go. That brings us to the end of the podcast. Uh, thanks for taking the time to listen. Tell all your mates about it, right? And, uh, and give us a review. Five. Five stars, eh? Five or stars. One. We don't. We don't. Well, care. yeah, we don't really uh, care. Do Let's we, be do honest. We care? As long as, yeah, we care. It fix our algorithm. Don't oh, even okay. don't even do one as a joke. Yeah, okay. Five, please. But uh, <laughs> until next time, we'll see you later.